We're now just weeks away from the Democratic primary for the Maryland governor. Election day is June 26th, and, election, er, and early voting starts on June 14th. Eight candidates are running, and now two, Rashern Baker and Ben Jealous, are going head-to-head -head in the polls contending for first. Today, we're joined with the only woman left in the race, Krish Vignaraja. Krish is the former policy director to Michelle Obama. Uh, she's a former State Department official, and she's here with me in our studio today. So thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. So, uh, Krish, we were speaking a bit off camera about some of your campaign videos that have gone viral, including one that features you breastfeeding, which uh, people are a bit up in arms about, um, and another one where you're reading angry tweets or mean tweets that tell you to go back to India or question why voters would vote vagina. Um, you're lagging in the polls a bit right now, but, uh, you know, a lot of voters are still undecided. So talk about why you're the best person to defeat our incumbent, Larry Hogan. Sure. I mean, you know, part of it is... Uh a lot of kind of what you've noted, um, I think, is actually connected to being a woman, uh, meaning that my campaign um, has been focused on uh, a range of issues um, connected to my experiences um, here growing up in Maryland, uh, but also uh, working as Michelle Obama's policy director. Um, I think I'm the most qualified because I'm not a career politician, but I have had executive experience at the highest levels. I managed a $51.6 billion budget while I was at the State Department. I ran multi-billion dollar initiatives for the First Lady. But ultimately, I think what voters care about is that they've heard a lot of politicians come um, into an election promising the moon and stars and failing to deliver. Um, I think people want to know that they have someone there who is one of them, um, who's going to be fighting for all of us. And I think that that's what our campaign has been about. Um, I've been called Donald Trump's worst nightmare um, in article after article. But for me, it's, it's not just about being anti-Trump or anti-Hogan. It's about putting forth an affirmative, positive agenda. And so for us, that's really focused on education, uh, revitalizing our economy, protecting our environment, um, supporting working families, um, addressing, you know, crime, um, making sure we provide a healthy, um, you, know, uh, you know, clean air, safe drinking water for our families, et cetera. So I want to uh, go through and unpack, I think, all of those. Um, and we can start with uh, the environment. Um, we recently saw devastating floods here in Ellicott City and parts of southwest Baltimore. Um, and of course, when Larry Hogan was first running for governor, he ran on this platform that uh, centered the, what he called the rain tax yeah. or the, um, you know, the mandate that uh, developers would have to put money into stormwater management. Um, how would you distinguish yourself from Hogan here? How would you um, sort of work to prevent uh, these kinds of extreme weather events, destroying communities, uh, and work to fight climate change? Yeah. Um, so I think the distinction between me and Governor Hogan on this issue is that I'm not going to play politics. Uh, Hogan, his rain tax resonated because people perceived previous administrations as nickeling, nickeling and diming folks. Um, and I get that. I understand why people feel like we have a high cost of living, we have high tax burden, a high tax burden, and that is something that I do want to address head on because our government doesn't operate as efficiently as efficiently as we need to. At the same time, the truth is that floods are natural in some ways, but when you see two 1,000-year storms that have happened within less than a thousand days of one another, clearly there's something bigger um, at issue. So part of what I want to address is the fact that, you know, we have to have better stormwater management. When you have, um, you know, uh, large developments, um, when you pave over Mother Nature's natural defenses and create roads or parking lots, what essentially you're creating are slides that become the conduit for the volume and velocity of water that we saw in Ellicott City, here in Baltimore City, Baltimore County. Um, this past weekend, I was in Ocean City. They saw the effects of it. Uh, last week, I was in Frederick. Um, and so this is where you realize this issue is going to come up time and time again. And the kind of political pandering is not leadership. Um, and the fact that uh, Governor Hogan has doubled down on this issue is, again, where I think he is so far out of sync with what people are feeling and where we need to go. But then, so how would you um, fund something like a stormwater management system, if not with something like the stormwater uh, development tax? Yeah, um, so it's a great question. I, I hope that people will tune in um, to our uh, 
policies on the website Chris for Maryland or Chris for Governor com because we actually have a very elaborate uh, flood plan um, to your specific question about how do you actually pay for this um, part of it is making sure that as developments are created um, we've got to make sure that the externalities basically the effects of these developments are included in the pricing of that construction and so what I mean by that is that if you're going to create a development, there have to be requirements for the flood water management that are the effect of that construction. Um, and you've uh, also supported uh, the 50 percent uh, clean energy by 2026 and 100 percent by 2035 here in Maryland. Um, advocates have been working on uh, this move to renewables for a long time. But talk about, again, how you would implement some of those yeah. um, plans. What does that actually mean for the state of Maryland? Yeah. Um, again, this is a sharp contrast with certainly Governor Hogan, um, but I also think that we have, uh, you know, one of the most bold, um, if not the boldest, uh, visions on this issue in the democratic field. Um, I believe you cannot set a target that isn't um, achieved during your administration. So when Governor Hogan says, I'm going to get to 40 percent by 2030, that basically means I'm not going to do it during my administration. It's why we have set a very clear 50 percent clean energy by 2026, meaning the end of my second term. What we're going to do is we're going to invest in offshore wind, solar energy, geothermal, but also energy efficiency. Um, you know, sometimes uh, I hear people say, um, my husband will say this sometimes, um, he runs the National Wildlife Federation, that uh, we need to eat our um, energy efficiency vegetables uh, before we enjoy our, um, you know, offshore wind, uh, solar energy um, dessert, because it's not as sexy to talk about energy efficiency, right? But it's actually a social justice issue. When you think about the fact that the families that are burdened by high electricity bills are the families who would benefit from better windows, but we don't provide the financing knowing that it pays for itself if we provide that initial financing is where we're focused on both making sure we invest in offshore wind, um, you know, solar panels on real opportunities across the state, um, knowing that geothermal is, you know, something that we're seeing in buildings, um, in homes, but we could definitely increase the usage of it. But also acknowledging that if we invest in energy efficiency in our schools, that we could reinvest that to rebuild our crumbling schools, that there are ways in which we can be much more innovative and smart about energy. Um, and switching gears a little bit, another, um, of course, issue that, you know, disproportionately impacts communities of color, um, uh, communities living in poverty, is uh, education. Um, you've said that this is, uh, in some sense, the center of your campaign. Uh, and Governor Larry Hogan has actually said that, you know, the problem of funding uh, in Maryland is not actually one of funding at all. It's uh, a problem of accountability, of accountability from schools, from, from teachers, from education officials. Um, how do you respond to that? And then also, more specifically, um, how do you, uh, or how would you uh, support the the findings of the Kerwin Commission? I mean, your your running mate Sharon Blake is a former teacher herself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, education is the reason I'm running, uh, and there are reasons for why we are called the education ticket. I'm the only candidate in the field who's the product of Maryland public schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. I'm the only candidate who's the daughter of two Baltimore City public school teachers. Um, my father, who uh, retired last year, was the oldest public school teacher in the state of Maryland at the age of 80. Um, he had taught 37 years here in Baltimore City. Um, my running mate, Sharon Blake, had taught for 43 years here in Baltimore City. She was the head of the teachers' union. And this is where we've got to revamp our schools, um, knowing that it has to be about policies from cradle to career. So part of that is investing in universal pre-K for three and four-year-olds, knowing that that divide between the haves and have-nots starts even before our kids go into school. Um, but part of it is fixing the funding inequities. When Governor Hogan says it's not about money, um, that's curious because, you know, he cut Baltimore City funding uh, by at least $41 million in direct funding. The Kerwin Commission um, estimates that we're underfunding Baltimore City schools by about $400 million. Um, you know, he's put $1.4 billion of casino and lottery revenues intended for our schools. That 
that was the promise that we made, he's put that into other purposes. And so it's easy to say that it's not a funding issue when he's cut all of this funding and used that money for other purposes. Uh, this is why I sometimes talk about him as a reverse Robin Hood. Um, he steals from the poor and he gives it to the rich. And this is where, not surprisingly, our schools have gone from first to seventh. Um, by some measure, I actually say saw that they got went from first to eleventh. And this is where, you know, it's got to be, when I say cradle to career, it's got to be about rebuilding our crumbling schools. I know when I was in Woodlawn High School, um, you know, I was learning in so-called temporary trailers, trying to learn in sweltering heat, freezing cold, um, and those trailers are still there, you know, 20 years later. Um, my parent, uh, my father, and my running mate both taught at Frederick Douglass, where our kids were literally freezing in classrooms. Um, but it also has to be about investing in science, technology, engineering, arts, math, financial literacy, civics education. Um, but it's also got to be about knowing that our schools have become community centers. Um, the number of kids living in poverty in Maryland has doubled uh, between 1990 and today. Uh, Michelle Obama was one of the first people to uh, kind of professionally teach me a common sense principle, which is no child can give their teacher their full attention on an empty stomach, which is why we want to provide free, hot, and healthy breakfasts and lunches. But, and I'll kind of conclude by, with this piece, um, I want to make sure that when our kids come out of school, they are either career ready or college ready. Some number of our kids are not going to go to college, and that's fine. But we've got to destigmatize the trades. Welders, electricians, plumbers, those are well-paying jobs. And we've got to prepare our kids when they come out of high school to be able to go into those jobs immediately. But for some kids who do want to go to a two and four year college, we got to make sure that financing isn't the reason that they don't. It's why we are offering and we will guarantee free community college, um, debt free tuition at our uh, HBCUs, our historically black colleges, but also 1% student loans because a Maryland student right now has on average $30,000 in student loans. And again, how will that free college be paid for? Um, what kinds of revenue streams would you use to fund that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so for free community college, um, we've got to be innovative here. Uh, community college is a good example of where I believe the intersection of our economy and education um, exists. So when you look at Pittsburgh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, um, you'll see uh, cities that have introduced public-private partnerships to pay for these smart programs. Um, you basically have public, uh, private employers knowing that a lot of these kids are the pipeline for their jobs, who actually finance to the tune of 70 million, 100 million, these kinds of programs. And so this is where we're gonna partly fund this through public-private partnerships. But part of it is also that we've gotta revamp our budget. Um, Joe Biden used to say this in the Obama administration when I served. Um, if you wanna know your values, look at your budget. We've got a 1950s backwards budget here. What I mean by that is we spend about as much on prisons and policing as we do on higher education. Uh, we spend twice as much on roads as we do on public transit. And we spend much less on early childhood education as other states. And so this is where there's an opportunity because community college, universal pre-K are some of the smartest investments we can make. So I'm hearing you uh, say this and I think you know, a lot of folks here in Baltimore might be skeptical of the idea of funding this with public-private partnerships because this city has uh, put, you know, billions of dollars into public-private partnerships, but frequently folks will um, wonder about, you know, the accountability to the city and to the people who are supposed to be benefiting. Um, so what kinds of measures could you put in place to ensure that, um, you know, it's actually the people who are supposed to be benefiting from these that who are? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah no, and so let me also just uh, clarify. So, you know, a substantial part of this will be government funding in the sense that um, we can't rely on private partnerships and we certainly will not be dictated to in terms of private partners funding. Uh, my point is that uh, once we have constructed exactly the kind of program that we want to institute, um, there are opportunities of where private partners can partner with us knowing that these are smart investments. Um, so for us, you know, part of how I will fund my education um, policy is making sure that the $1.4 billion in revenues goes kind of going forward to where it was intended. Uh, Part of it is actually making sure that we are investing, um, you know, funding, uh, you know, from um, the legalization of marijuana um, into uh, education, knowing that it is the smartest investment. And the truth is that this strategy we have of, uh, of not going down that road um, is untenable and unwise. 
Um, part of it is also making sure that we do think creatively about public-private partnerships. So um, a good example of the kind of approach I would have is um, based on my career. So when I uh, led um, and launched Let Girls Learn, uh, this was an initiative that the First Lady um, had uh, focused on um, making sure girls got uh, middle school and high school educations. So what we did was um, I took that from a seed of an idea to bringing in seven federal agencies and a billion dollars of government funding. And that's how you make sure that the anchor is strong, right? That you're not getting dictated to uh, by private partners, um, that the accountability exists. But what we did was we leveraged uh, the government funding by bringing in over 100 private partners and over $3 billion of private capital. And this is what we can do even with universal pre-K, um, because we know that for every dollar we in invest, we have a $38 return on that investment. $19 between kindergarten through 12th grade and another $19 of savings once that child graduates from high school. And that's where I just think that we've got to be smarter about how we put um, you know, funding into certain programs. Um, so Baltimore Public Schools, uh, Maryland's public schools have, you know, been the focus of a lot of um, this education policy, but Maryland also has a really interesting charter school program. Um, we have some of the most regulated charters in the country, um, some of the only u unionized charter teachers. Um, what would you do to preserve those sorts of regulations for charters in Maryland? Yeah, I mean, look, the truth is that we're seeing innovation in both our public schools as well as in charters. and. I'm not, I mean, no one should be against innovation, right? If we can uh, facilitate laboratories of experimentation, knowing that there is a lot that is going wrong with our schools, but there are also smart programs that work that should be scaled. And so my approach is, um, you know, I, I don't take a hard and fast rule on any of these strategies. Um, if we do have hard and fast rules, the truth is we will lose a generation of kids. Kids who, frankly, remind me of myself in the sense that, you know, I went from some struggling schools, um, Edmondson Elementary, John and Cake Middle, Woodlawn High School. But I went from Woodlawn High to the White House because there were some smart programs that we invested in. So when I was in high school, um, we had Governor Schaefer um, who invested in a uh, magnet program at Woodlawn High. And the idea was to make investments, seed investments, in struggling schools. And so that pre-engineering math science program is what sparked my interest and led me to study molecular biology at Yale. And so my goal is let's try to foster that kind of innovation. Let's try to make strategic investments so that regardless of what zip code, what district a child grows up in, they have a basic shot to realize their potential. Um, to again switch gears, we're, we're seeing a bit of a crisis in policing here in Baltimore. Um, you know, just last week, um, these two officers from the Gun Trace Task Force were uh, sentenced to a combined 43 years for racketeering, for uh, overtime fraud, for robbing drug yeah. dealers. Um, and your your brother, Thiru Vignaraja, is actually running for state's attorney. Um, but but talk about how you, as governor, would sort of distinguish, distinguish yourself from um, the tough on crime programs that Harry, Larry Hogan has actually worked with some Democrats to pass. Um, what would you do to sort of fight this crisis of policing? Yeah. Um, so there is a range of problems um, that are at the root of, of this issue. Part of it is Governor Hogan has not accepted that these failed strategies of mass incarceration, um, zero tolerance, mandatory minimums, um, the racist war on drugs, that they're failing. And so for me, it's about refocusing our attention. It's about recognizing that there has been a school to prison pipeline. Um, a lot of those kids are ones, uh, are kids who, you know, share in my running mate um, and my father taught. And they're smart kids, right? They want to do the right thing. But when you see an at risk youth, you got to make sure that there's an in intervention early on. It's why, even at the White House, we had a mentoring program. And it wasn't to identify the valedictorians of, of, of classes, it was to identify kids who were smart, um, but who had, uh, you know, mental health issues, um, family problems, uh, you know, financial troubles. Um, who had gotten in trouble uh, prior. Um, and you realize that you can turn around a kid's life uh, by intervening. Um, it's why Operation Safe Kids was incredibly effective. And you saw Governor Hogan defund that and only start to refund it when he held hostage the program by saying, um, I'll only refund it if you address mandatory minimums, which again, we know that that's not the way to address this issue. Um, part of it is realizing that you know addiction is not a crime. 
It's a disease, and it needs to be treated as such. And so this is where, you know, obviously you asked the budget question. This is where it's a win-win, where our moral um, interests align with our monetary interests. To put a prisoner, um, you know, behind bars costs us $38,000 to $45,000 a year. To put that person into treatment costs five to $10,000, which means that for every person we put into a Baltimore prison, we could be paying for uh, 30 um, families affordable housing. We could be paying for 37 um, GED courses for individuals. And so that's where you know these strategies um, are losing. But when it comes to policing, this is where we've got to revamp the system. The fact that, um, so my the overarching policies that um, Sharon and I have put uh, out, one is on community policing, so you'll again be able to see it on, on our website. Another is on safe schools and safe streets. When it comes to community policing, it's about making sure that our law enforcement look like, live in, uh, and work with our communities, meaning that 40 percent of our uh, officers are African American. Only 20 percent are women. That's obviously very different than the demographic that they patrol. Likewise, only 20 percent of our officers live within the city's jurisdictions. And that's where we've got to recruit from local communities. We've got to incentivize police officers engaging with boys and girls clubs, um, working with recreation centers. Um, we've got to invest in the kind of community uh, patrolling task force, um, those opportunities, because that's how we'll get the better results. Um, but the other piece of it is when I talk about safe streets and safe schools, look, it's great that we have focused on mass shootings. But the truth is here in Baltimore, we have a mass shooting every month. And that's where we've got to address that, you know, this gun violence has to be addressed head on. Um, and so for, for us, that's about addressing that, you know, safe schools um, is not just an issue of uh, guns, it's an issue of public health. Um, it's about working with law enforcement, and it's about instituting smarter gun violence prevention policies, like making sure that every gun is uh, registered and insured, just as we do with our cars. It's about making sure that the age to purchase a gun is 21, uh, just as we have for other um, rules. It's about making sure that we're, you know, arming our teachers not with guns, but with guidance counselors, um, with counselors who can address the fact that, you know, many of the problems that, you know, we are addressing are mental health ones. Um, you talk about the need for more uh, police of color, more police from the communities, but you know, here at the Real News, we've actually noted that some of the police in the Gun Trace Task Force are uh, people who are from like the communities that they're yeah. serving. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some structural reforms. Like you support legalizing marijuana for recreational use, um, but do you believe that people currently incarcerated for marijuana-related crimes should be pardoned? Um, and then. Uh, for instance, in Oakland, there's a program uh, where those incar incarcerated for marijuana are the first in line for dispensary licenses as sort of a form of reparations. Um, what kinds of steps like this would you take to to, to bring justice to those uh, incarcerated for marijuana? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so we're gonna, you know, what I plan to do as governor is to take a hard look and look um, at kind of the current population and how to kind of address in a, um, you know, just way, uh, the fact that, you know, it has been a racist war on drugs, simply put. Um, and so it is going to be about not just addressing the incarcerated population, it's got to also be about the fact that there are a lot of collateral consequences when someone comes out of prison, um, you know, for a simple uh, offense of possession. Um, it's got to be about expungement. expungement of their records. It's got to be also about making sure that there is a pathway to reentry. Um, you know, there is no reason for why, you know, with our inc incarcerated population, um, the ability to vote is taken away. Um, just two days ago, I was having a conversation uh, with a former felon, Julius, um, who, incredibly bright, incredibly articulate um, individual, who complained legitimately about the fact that, you know, he's had a number of job interviews when the, his criminal record comes up, it's the end of the conversation. And so unless our strategy is we're going to lock folks up and throw away the keys, what we do does not make sense. In Maryland, the recidivism rate is 40 percent. In Baltimore City, it's 73 percent. And so we've got to figure out how when people are in prison, they are either going to be, become better criminals or they're going to become better people. 
And so I think that there are ways in which we could invest to make sure it's the latter rather than the former. The fact that only 0.001% of uh, incarcerated individuals have access to um, you know, vocational or GED training makes no sense. And so that's where I think that there are some real opportunities. And then finally, um, as we've noted a couple times, you're now the only woman um, running for governor of Maryland, uh, with Valerie Irvin backing Rashawn Baker. Um, and your uh, ballot is actually the, or your candidacy is only, actually the only one in history to ever have two women of color uh, on a gubernatorial uh, uh, platform. But but talk a little bit about how you would use that platform as governor to uplift uh, women, um, you know, people who are uh, sexual or gender minorities, um, but people of color. Talk about how you would go beyond representation to really uplift those who are uh, seeing the worst of these effects. Yeah, yeah. You know, in the great state of Harriet Tubman and Barbara Mikulski, the fact that out of 14 federal and statewide offices, so that's the eight congressmen, two senators, and the four statewide officials, we have not a single woman in any of those seats. Um, that's uh, unacceptable. Um, and, you know, as the only woman in this race, it is reflective of where Maryland is um, in the sense that we come in 50th out of 50 when it comes to child care subsidies. Uh, as of this past legislative session, we were still debating rapists having paternity rights. Maryland was one of the six states that still allowed for that. And so that's where you realize that that zero has an effect. Um, when you think about what that means, you realize that there is an incredible opportunity this election cycle. Um, when people said to me, as I was you know, contemplating Sharon Blake, um, someone who has lived the struggles of a lot of Maryland families, um, you know, she committed her life, uh, her career, to empowering youth here in Baltimore City. Um, and people said, well, you can't have an all-woman ticket. And you certainly can't have an all-woman of color ticket. I said, why not? Um, how many times have we had the exact opposite? And no one has ever complained. And this is where I think that we have an opportunity to actually put our policies, to put our priorities, to put our funding into the things that matter, to address the fact that here in Baltimore, we have the highest number of deaths due to air pollution, that here in Baltimore we have skyrocketing crime. But, um, you know, though we are never going to say, thank goodness Donald Trump was elected, I have never seen um, the electorate more mobilized um, in the recent past. Uh, the last time I saw this to be the case was when my old, my old bosses got elected. And so this is where I do, um, I'm incredibly ex inspired and excited about this election because, look, we um, have gained momentum over the last few months uh, because as people have heard our message, they've gotten excited. Um, we have won forum after forum. We have uh, been, um, you know, I've been called out as sort of the standout in debate after debate um, against the quote unquote front runners with nearly half of the electorate still um, undecided. For us, the point is that it's not that people hear our message and it doesn't resonate. It's that, you know, people are still being introduced to our campaign. We just started one of the biggest uh, campaign ad buys um, uh, of any of the candidates this week. And so the polling is only reflecting what's happened in the past. Just as people are tuning in is when, when they're hearing kind of our campaign. And so we're very excited. But it's also that, you know, 2018 is the year of the woman. Um, you know, just uh, yesterday, we saw in Virginia, out of the six, um, six out of the seven uh, um, elections in Virginia were won by women. Uh, that seventh race, there was not a woman running in it. And so this is where when you realize, you know, um, to your first question of uh, what, you know, stands, what uh, allows you to stand out in this race, it's that we actually have a competitive edge against Governor Hogan. Um, the conventional wisdom is that no man can beat Larry Hogan. Well, I'm no man. And that's important because when Democrats have picked up seats against incumbent Republicans in this past year, 61% of those seats were won by women. And that's where I think that we have an opportunity. Texas, Idaho, Virginia, um, those were elections where women, even though they were outmatched in terms of financing, even though the polls had them significantly down, time and time again, race after race, you saw women won because people are sick 
of the same old you know politics as usual and people are sick of the old boys club and that's where I think people are looking for a new generation of leadership and that's what we represent and I'm excited to you know kind of look um, at what's to come and what's going to happen in the next uh, um, week and a half because I think that we're going to surprise a lot of folks. All right. Well, we'll see what happens, I guess, and keep us posted on the campaign trail. Absolutely. We'll do. Thanks, for have, thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for being with us today. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.